Hi there, it's Marcus here. I want to talk to you about experiential learning, the road less traveled. And uh, this is actually a slight expansion on a talk I gave earlier today for Chandigarh University and its uh, teacher uh, education uh, program. So thank you to Chandigarh University for initiating this thought bubble. and I've, But I've extended it a little bit simply because I know I've got as much time as I like, basically. But I'm, I'm going to jump out of the sort of this panel here for a moment and come into my study. Uh, what uh, my life has been has been a, a, a teacher, uh, educator, uh, academic researcher, social experimenter, cultural play uh, uh, clown in a sense, or jester sometimes. Uh, I frequently say the most outrageous things and often get up to uh, quite a bit of mischief, especially you know before COVID when we could dance and jump around and everything. But for me, the experience of learning and how it's curated by myself or an institution, a, a school, is, is actually really, really very important. It, it reflects the learning culture, the priorities of a, of a place and a time and a community. I wanted to pull into my study because over there, oops, wrong way, that way, i am sort of got to think backwards here. Um, I have a shield that was uh, made by a student of mine, Chris, good on you. Uh, a few years ago as part of a uh, hands-on history program that we were running uh, for a third years and it's a viking shield and he made it using traditional uh, tools uh, he made the nails and studs himself he he crafted the wood and so on and he wrote it up as a project he did it because experiential history like experiential uh, uh, archaeology you know is a very important dimension to understanding the uh, the material culture uh, and the kind of knowledge and learning and skill sets that go with it but on the other side of me now going this way you know you can see I've got horns hanging up there and so on as well which are from you know uh, mid 20th century Spain actually uh, I've had them they've been with me for 40 years or more or oh, 50 nearly, and that's a bit scary, isn't it? Um, but, you know, so the material culture is very, very important. And it, that's one dimension of the world to be experienced in order to better understand it. So now I'm going to jump into the more formal part of the lecture. I just wanted to give a little bit of that sense of who I am. But also, I guess one other thing I should say um, as a preface, is that I've spent uh, 20 years working in state education systems for a little while in Victoria, but then I moved into uh, a neo-humanist Ananda Marga school run in, in Stanthorpe, where I taught for five years of yoga, spirituality, and very much outdoors experiential education sort of processes there. Then I moved to uh, Pine Community School in Brisbane, where I also taught, but that was a um, democratic uh, school uh, and run in a very open learning uh, environment. Again, totally experiential. We would create events all over the place. Then I ended up in Montessori. Why? Because I, and I'm going to talk about it a little bit in this lecture or talk, uh, because I wanted to understand some of the materiality that Montessori deployed in order to convey very abstract concepts like maths and, and so on, uh, which I often felt I really wanted to do better. And by the end of that, um, uh, I ended up sort of jumping ship and, and coming to a university to pull this stuff together in a PhD uh, and to uh, very quickly ended up teaching at the university and teaching great courses like the the one over here, uh, which I uh, thoroughly enjoyed. And of course, I'm still doing that today. Hence, I'm here. So I'm going to now uh, segue into this talk. Um, so what we've got is experiential learning. It's a road less travel because it's something that's very hard, I think, for people to get their heads around because we're so institutionalized. Uh, and we have such a, an emphasis on education that manages 
bulk numbers and is premised on managerialism, conformism, uh, and so on. Despite the best attempts to sort of um, make it more interactive, there's uh, a, quite a gap between, you know, ideals and our goals and the practices that we uh, experience. Now, this is a photograph from a school that I've been working with for over well, close on 30-ish years. And I started working on the curriculum for the school, the River School in Mullaney, in 1993, for instance, like that, before it opened. And, you know, I'm now lucky enough to be on the school board. Um, and I've seen it evolve. My, uh, my kids have gone to that school as well. Um, now, here we've got a, a teacher playing, but, that, you know, it's also, you can see there's yoga happening there, if you are familiar with yoga. Uh, and they're outdoors, they're not in a classroom. These are elements of experiential learning that uh, I'm going to touch upon now. But before um, we go into, I guess, sort of uh, the more theoretical aspect, I want to talk about some other things. So let's let's move into, if I've got to move myself out of the way here. So this is an awesome, I, don't, I love hanging out in the... Uh, uh, in the cosmos like this. Hello, <laughs> there I am. But, you know, I want to touch on, a, I guess, a shopping list of some of the things that came to me uh, when I started thinking, well, what does experience involve? So it, it involves inquiry and curiosity. Any experience in a uh, learning environment that cultivates the learning around experience immediately initiates inquiry stimulates curiosity it grows and fosters passion and it's also about aesthetics aesthetics is about beauty and of course and culture but it's also about relationships and i guess relationships that feel good or feel right why does a circle in a square feel good uh, it's because there are certain aesthetic elements to the human brain that um read it that way and i think that's you know quite clearly a, a biological encoded thing, not just a cultural thing, though, of course, cultural aesthetics give different shapes to that. It's experience, like with that photograph on the, on the opening image there of the uh, teacher standing with her little students, it's embodied, it's holistic, it's about the body in action. Not always the body, but it is embodied. It has that strong embodied quality. It's about the mind in action. Sometimes the mind is less in action and sometimes it's more. And of course, it's a, there's the spirit there as well. It's a spiritual thing. Um, and, and you can come at spirituality whichever way you like. But for me, spirituality is about the awareness of a relationship and, a, and an inner outer ecology. To use uh, a friend of mine, Dada Shambhu Shivananda, he, he developed that concept that there's an inner and outer world that we can work with. But he saw it as an ecological, relational, dynamic system. And I think that's really important. Then what is it? It's a case learning through doing. There's application, but there's also discovery. So there's this trial and error dimension to experiential learning where if you don't, it doesn't work today, it might work tomorrow. And because it's open-ended and it's driven by the experiencer, that means the student or the child, um, it's also owned by them. It's not something that's imposed. Oh, you're going to keep on doing that spelling test until you get 100%. Every day coming back to that, that's just, that's destructive. It's toxic. John Dewey says so too, and I think I would agree with him. Relevance and meaning it brings relevance and meaning to the world of learning as I just sort of, I guess, spoke to in the previous point. It's also about purpose and seeing relationships uh, and not just seeing but enacting relationships because a lot of experiences need to, uh, you know, have a collective dimension. Um, experience is not something that just the individual does. The experience is also about an encounter. But it's, it may be an encounter where you, with peers colleagues you might say you might be seven year old colleagues are trying to work something out it might be to do with insect life or the life cycle of a, of a butterfly or it might be something to do with uh, a why is it so sort of science chemistry reaction in the kitchen by carb soda and vinegar whatever it is it can involve collective inquiry it's not necessarily just isolated individuals doing this and of course all of that leads to agency i as a learner invest my time and find my power 
my purpose, my activism in the doing. And that means, of course, activism can also move, and I'm going to touch on it a little bit later, into the social dimension where we become socially active. It might be to do with uh, pro protecting endangered frogs down in a creek or, you know, removing um, some kind of uh, invasive weed that's strangling and, and choking the creek and so on. It can take many forms. And last of all, and that's where we're going with this image here wonder and awe just sometimes the experience is just overwhelming it overwhelms our senses and we just stand there in wonder and awe uh, the sort of thing that happened when I used to run uh, build raku uh, kilns in the schools that I worked in and we'd and we'd always strategically time it to have the main part of the firing happening at night so the kids would stay back or come back with their parents and you know these the raku kiln will be glowing in the dark and flames spurting out and and we'd be pulling out the materials from the raku kiln in a non-traditional raku manner i must add <laughs> i confess but you know it was fun it, but it was also just awe inspiring and the kids who were involved in those experiences remember them to this day so let's keep moving then so i want to now move to India, to a, an amazing uh, education thinker, or he's more than just an educationist, but you know, at, uh, he was deeply invested in education. Chitranjan Das is a man from Odisha or Orissa, and uh, he ran a school in the 1950s for four years, which was called the Forest School. And this is what he said in his book, you know, it's a beautiful book. Our school veritably embraces the entire universe. The effort in our school is not directed towards securing a job by pleasing a few officers. The passion for knowledge, the ability of discrimination and responsiveness to emotion with which we have set up this forest school should also inculcate in us the patience of a learner who enters every realm of the world with an inquisitive mind. Everyone in this wide world is our guru. So there's a, uh, a photograph from uh, the Montessori School, which I work with quite closely, Montessori International College. Um, they are, like his Ranjan Das's uh, students, in the forest. You know, at that, again, out of doors, they're experiencing the expansiveness of having bodies in and out of doors, green space, but they're still working collectively and they are on a, exploring things socially. That's the circle often makes that uh, particular point very, very clear. So Chitran Jandas ran that school until the um, Orissan uh, state government and education department decided it was uh, not a good idea uh, because it didn't meet or match their goals in terms of you know an, an industrial education system so you know he he, he closed the school and uh, well he he actually moved out of the school i don't don't think it closed it probably became a regular state school so from there we can also jump to another great experimenter in pedagogy and a person who also believed in circles uh rabindranath tagore and his work uh, at shanti nikitan and uh, the university there of Vishvabharati, uh, which is a great uh, place to visit. So this Vishvabharati is still running today. This is a, a, a recent photograph of uh, students in an outdoor circular classroom. A classroom, isn't that a funny word, classroom? You think of rectangles and desks and everything, don't we? So um, Chattopadhyay, uh, who's talking about uh, Tagore's uh, vision, um, he, he makes this point, the hallmark of the indigenous education was learning through experience, again, but the school curriculum more or less being designed for educating within such a philosophical framework had to be value loaded. And that's important to recognise. The education where a kind of adventure, that's great, a kind of absorption that was very much a part of the curricular objectives. But this, he says this, but such experiences are difficult to structure and cannot be put in the assembly line of industrialized education. So he was writing this in the year 2000. Um, but, you know, I've been to uh, Bishop Bharati uh, a number of times uh, uh, since then, and it's still running like this. It's, it's, it's changing. It's being affected, impacted by the, you know, 
modern uh, world is in no place is immune but it's uh, you know it's running well and the whole point is that again it's challenging dominant assumptions about order and the way education functions education is not about delivering information in a package that students then learn to manage it's actually about a deeper form of engagement with one's learning so let's keep moving so <clears throat> This is interesting. Why is it doing that? All right, so I'm going to turn to Rachel Kesson first. I'll just move myself over here. So Rachel Kesson, in a wonderful um, chapter in a book, uh, uh, Schools with Spirit, um, she makes this following point. The body will not grow if it is not fed. The mind will not flourish unless it is stimulated and guided. And the spirit of the child will suffer if it is not nurtured. When students participate in a curriculum that invites them to share what matters most to them, learning comes alive with connections that bring meaning, higher order thinking and motivation. But I emboldened the meaning part because I think when we have meaning, we have uh, skin in the game. We, you know, we're invested in it. And then Ranjan, Parabhat Ranjan Saka makes this point, okay, uh, which is, again, it's about developing a thirst for knowledge. It must be awakened, he says, you know, to quench the thirst, proper education must be given. Only then will education be worthwhile and develop the three, the body, the mind and the ideals of the student. OK, so there's a meaning and a thirst for knowledge that uh, experiential learning gives us direct access to. Students will find uh, meaning in, their, in what they do uh, if they're lucky. You know, there are certain students whom I've had and or I've seen that go through uh, learning systems where they already have their inner compass, their inner direction, but they're relatively few and far between. Most students are experiencing education as something that's done to them. Okay, so let's look at John Dewey now. I'm going to pull myself down again. I'll throw myself over here this time. John Dewey, he you know, wrote that very famous book, Experience in Education. And he makes this point. He says, well, what kind of experience? Because it really is important to be clear about this. He's a philosopher, of course. Experience in education can't be directly equated to each other. Okay. For some experiences are miseducative. They teach us the wrong things. Any experience is miseducative that has the effect of arresting or distorting the growth of further experience. It goes on. Right. A philosophy of education, like any theory, has to be stated in words or symbols. But so far as it has, uh, sorry, it is more than verbal, it is a plan for conducting education. Like any plan, it must be framed with reference to what is to be done. So we need to have, be clear about that and how it is to be done. Okay, so again, he's now saying we have to have conscious control over this experience. And finally, he says philosophy must be based on a philosophy of experience. And that, I think, is really, really important. That this philosophy of experience needs to understand that experience can misdirect it's not that students aren't having an experience of education in a, in a regular school. Of course they are. But the experience is one that uh, suppresses curiosity, uh, tends to give them a sense that learning is about information management. It teaches them uh, about hierarchy, power structures. Uh, it teaches uh, some to resist learning and become uh, you know, anti-learning all their lives. And whilst others... Uh, climb the sort of hierarchy of uh, rewards that, uh, you know, the good student uh, is, uh, I guess, seduced by, you could say, in many, many cases. So it, there are a whole bunch of miseducational processes there, whereas a conscious understanding of experience as something that we need to craft, we need to be very clear about where we sit and how it works. So let's keep moving then and see what I've got here. So we need to map it. So what does it mean, to flick back to Dewey for a moment, to have a philosophy experience? Well, we need to understand that it, there are domains okay for experience and that these domains um these domains evoke different forms of recognition of experience so there's outer experience there's social experience there's cultural experience and there's inner experience so the you know the outer experiences involve the 
student in nature or the cosmos, there's the experience of built environment and the experience of things that populate that environment. It's a, 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 and all those things have functions uh, and they some will stimulate uh, and others might repel the student. But these outer experiences need to be understood as potential for deep learning. Then there are the social experiences, systems and relationship, institutions, collaboration, activism, ethics and justice, uh, all the kinds of experiences that a social uh, context will elicit. And the teacher can guide or shape or respond or just provoke. You know, there's the, this is not teacher uh, uh, who is it the didactic. This is teacher who is often a co-learner. I was certainly was and certainly am. You know, I knew nothing about how to build <laughs> Viking shields, but I learned and, you know, um, the reward was actually in seeing Chris go through this amount of research. And, and so it's not just, you know, building the shield. It's how, do, how were the shields crafted? What were they made for? Different types of shields, different periods in Viking history where the sh different shields were, uh, you know, manufactured and so on. There was so much to learn. So moving on, cultural experience. It is, so it's about aesthetics. The shield is designed beautifully and, and, and so on. Uh, it's about values. It's about stories and myths, ethos, morality and religion. Cultural experiences uh, can be everything from singing in a choir where you're in a group experience of shared exhilaration singing in the choir. But it can be many things. It can be poetry, but it can also be science. Of course, religion is there. It's about morality and morality links up with the social experiences where we're talking ethics and justice. You know, so this is another domain in which multiple experiences of different kinds. And then there's the inner experience where spirituality, direct spirituality, meditation, yoga, tai chi, qigong, indigenous spiritualities of all kinds, uh, reflection, inner reflection, being able to reflect on oneself, embodiment, the actual just being in the body, you know, being in the body, digging in the garden, or running and just feeling the, the exhilaration of running. These are valuable experiences. Emotions, what does it mean to love or to hate or to dislike or feel anxiety? How do we deal with those things? Well, this is part of the inner experience that we can learn from if we're in a conducive, supportive environment. Rationality and devotion. Because rationality is key, and particularly in my world of neo-humanist education, you know, to understand that rationality helps free the mind from the fetters of conditioned cultural habits, uh, habits that often restrict and, and limit our ability to perceive relationship. Devotion, of course, is about the, the emotive links in relational uh, meaning. And then, of course, there's meaning and purpose there as well. What does it mean for me? to be here now you know one of the i've got it over there somewhere it's down yeah where is it where did i put it i'm not sure uh i've got a, a wonderful uh, i draw on it for this lecture in a slide or two a book of letters from e.o wilson edward o wilson very uh, famous um scientist in entomology but he's also a public intellectual he's written a bunch of letters to uh future scientists type thing and and he talks about meaning and purpose and passion and these are things that i think link very much up with the inner experience okay so let's look at the, uh, then i've talked about uh near humanism a little bit just now so education is that which liberates Prabhat ranjan saka states that very clearly and in neo-humanist context, like the school, uh, this is from the River School, the school that I work with uh, most in this area, you know, is about providing a wide range of experiences from the technological through to the ecological, through to the community uh, beach uh, where they, you know, they're actually not doing a traditional lesson in any way, but they uh, are still learning and they're learning to uh, deal with the world around them and, and experience it in, in an embodied way. That's important. So the near humanist environment is a, an environment that takes you out of doors, takes you into multiple contexts. And of course, I can imagine many of you who are regular teachers listening to this and saying, well, we do this with our school. 
But there's a broader cultural element that underpins all of this. And it goes back to that map that I showed you before. So let's go back to that map for a moment. It's about body, mind, spirit. It, and it explicitly addresses all those dimensions and, and creates the opportunity for students to find their own experiential spaces of valid action. This is what empowers a student. And it needs to be woven in, as John Dewey says, with a philosophy, a direct philosophy. So neo-humanism is a philosophy of relational uh, meaning making, you could say. Montessori, where I'm going next, has a very similar approach. Montessori, Maria Montessori said, look, hang on, guys, if we're going to do this and experiential stuff, we need to prepare the environment. In the Montessori world, the environment is designed for children to initiate their own learning experiences by providing a range of provocations or stimuli in the environment, particularly in the uh, pre uh, uh, prep through to 12, you could say, those two uh, early cycles. Um, and for these children, they are facilitated in their learnings. And it's a range of learnings. And then, of course, when they hit adolescence, they go outside. There, I said that photograph early on of the children, uh, the adolescents sitting in a circle. That's from this school, from a Montessori school. And it's, uh, it, it takes them out into the world. So the experiences become wider. The whole actual world is our prepared environment. It is prepared for us just by the way culture works. Culture is, of course, as an educational or pedagogic uh, machine, and it teaches you know, uh, a wide range of things. But if we're not looking properly, and I'm going to come to that in a moment, we will miss the opportunities. Inquiry-based learning actually facilitates or fosters self-initiated learning approaches. So what can we say? So Maria Montessori said, look, what is most characteristic of our system of education is the emphasis that is placed upon the environment. John Dewey backs this up, uh, writing you know, in a contemporary sense to Montessori. They, they were contemporaries. Experience does not go on simply inside a person. That's just one part of that four quadrant model I showed you. It, go, it does go on there for it influences the formation of attitudes and of desire and purpose and so on. So that's the internal. But he says there's more. This is not the whole of the story. Every genuine experience has an active side, which changes in some degree the objective conditions, okay, under which experiences are had. So in other words, there's this fold between the objective environment, the way we actively engage with it, and this informs our internal work, our internal experience, as we internalize the experience. So the objective conditions will shape the internal experience, the internal experience, and the way we make sense out of that experience will fall back into our reading of the objective world. So everything then, in this sense, comes to an encounter. But how do we see the world? This is really important. Jeremy Haywood, in another great chapter from a book uh, called The Heart of Learning, is, is called Unlearning to See the Sacred. He makes this point, and I think it's really important for, if we're going to think about experience and how to initiate it in our own classrooms or our own uh, practice. We grow up to perceive certain things and to not, and to not perceive other things. And what we can and cannot perceive depends to a surprisingly large extent on what we believe. In other words, that's, that's the internal, on our vision of our world and what it is made of. But the world is tapping on our consciousness all the time. I chose to uh, share this image of uh, these uh, glow-in-the-dark fluorescent uh, toadstools. We have them in my garden here when we're during the rainy season, and they are mesmerizing. They invite us to inquire. But it's easy to not see them. It's easy to overlook the incredible learning that can happen uh, from an encounter with a fluorescent mushroom, toadstool, fungi. All right? So let's keep moving. 
Okay, so now I want to turn to um, the son of a friend of mine, actually. Kathleen Kesson uh, wrote uh, this book, Unschooling in Paradise. And, you know, I've luckily been able to uh, be a colleague and I would say a distant friend. We live on different continents of Kathleen for uh, a long time. And she, she recently retired and her first... Uh, thing about uh, with retirement was I want to write up what happened to me and my kids during the 1980s when she homeschooled them and she wrote this beautiful book Unschooling in Paradise and this particular slide uh, looks at Sh her son Shaman and his grasshopper curriculum which was totally self-initiated so Kathleen makes the following point uh, going the wrong way uh, Shaman's grasshopper curriculum while not structured by a lesson plan Kathleen never planned it out to, to kick this off. He initiated himself, was definitely not unstructured. In fact, there was a deep structure to the activity because inquiry creates its own structure. Inquiry brings forth a set of questions that's, that once you've responded to that question, then there is another question and so on. And certainly as she lays out this grasshopper curriculum, um, with herself basically as observer, uh, just on the side, she just happened to make sure that, you know, when you're homeschooling, you've got resources there. So she had a, a world book encyclopedia in the house. And Shaman, who was only eight, watching these grasshopper, uh, went off and he created his whole learning project himself. It's a fantastic story. So Alfred North Whitehead, in his Aims of Education, written just a little bit later than John Dewey's, um, education is the guidance of the individual towards a comprehension of the art of life. So young shaman entered into the art of life. And by the art of life, I mean, this is Whitehead now, uh, the most complete achievement of varied activity expressing the living potentialities of that living creature in the face of its actual environment, okay? I mean the most complete achievement of varied activity. So Shaman drew, he researched, he wrote, he, he learnt about mandibles on uh, grasshoppers, he measured the distance, there was maths involved, the distance, I mean, the, 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 the insects jumping and so on. Uh, the, all of this emerged. But it's the art of life, it's the art of inquiry. It's very, very interesting because, you know, Shaman uh, went on not to become an entomologist and study grasshoppers. He actually went on to become a professor at a university, okay, in Sanskrit. So, you know, this, this lesson was not lost on him. And here's Edward O. Wilson and those letters that I was mentioning. So he just wants to make one point that I, I'm picking up here. He said, put passion ahead of training. Training without passion is, is dead, okay? Feed passion, or feed it with the knowledge that the mind needs to grow. So this again is to do with the environment. It's, it's how we have set up the environment to foster or support um, deeper learning through experience, okay? And then I wanna end with this particular slide. I'm gonna move myself up here so you can enjoy the beauty of this green turtle. Chasing the green turtle. Um, another thinker in this area is uh, a woman called Laura Roden, Reardon and she was reflecting in a chapter, in a book I'm going to show you and give you the details in a moment uh, about a learning incident that she blew she missed the opportunity and she felt really bad about it and that sometimes when we miss the opportunity, it's an incredibly valuable lesson for the longer term. So don't feel bad about all the missed opportunities in life. Uh, we've all got them. I've missed opportunities many a time when so, you know, you're in a trance and you're working with kids and it's sort of two o'clock in the afternoon and we're all semi-zombie-ish uh, and, and so on. So th there's, no, <laughs> there's no problems with that. That's just what happens. But it's being alive as a teacher, being present, as bell hooks would say, to the moment, totally present. And of course, Laura's story is a story of her down at the beach with students, and it's a beautiful beach, and the students are doing their thing when a green turtle 
an endangered species swims past and the children see it and they are so excited and they swim out towards it the turtles moving away one of the kids actually manages to get close enough to the turtle just to touch its its shell and that spooks the, the animal and it's it's off very very fast and uh, the children come back to shore they were exhilarated and bubbling uh, but Laura and her colleague, another teacher, they were aghast. This is a, uh, an endangered species. It says in the law that no one's supposed to harass them or chase them. And so they go up and they scold these kids. And later on, uh, uh, months later or maybe a, a year later, she's at a conference. And this is what happened. She, this guy uh, at the conference, a uh, man called Finch, I don't know his first name because I, I can't remember now, uh, He's saying, these are the learning experiences that really count. Don't judge, don't squash children's learning through some sort of moral or righteous um, indignation or whatever. And she said, oh, my face became hot with recognition as Finch talked about how we adults often stamp out children's zeal with our admonitions when in fact we should encourage their sense of wonder. So this is what we need to do. We need to enter into and value experience. Experience is the mother of learning. We ourselves need to chase those green turtles wherever we find them. And I think that's the lesson I want to leave you with, or the message I want to leave you with. We've got to chase our own green turtles wherever they may be. So I thank you very much and wish you good turtle chasing. Farewell.